<laughs> you are listening to the Monday Night War Review, where Frankincensed, Big Business, and Big Techs chronologically review the Monday Night Wars from 1995 to 2001 between WCW Nitro and WWF Monday Night Raw. Join us for this roller coaster ride of nostalgia and hilarity. Welcome to the Monday Night War Review. We are doing the October 2nd, 1995 episodes of Monday Night Raw and WCW Monday Nitro. Nitro last week was building up to a Lex Luger Macho Man match that we are going to get tonight. Um, but it was a little strange last week on Nitro because both Macho and Luger looked a little weak. Uh, Macho got like laid out in the ring uh, during his match with the Taskmaster when the Giant came out and gave him a big choke slam. And then Luger also got choke slammed during that scuffle. And then Luger lost to Ming in a match when Ming pulled out a foreign object, a spike, and stuck Luger in the throat with it, basically. Both Savage and Luger looked pretty weak, but uh, we are going to get them tonight on Nitro. And if Lex Luger loses, he's going to forfeit his WCW World title shot, and he's going to leave the WCW for good. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. We have Bischoff, Mongo, and Heenan on commentary as usual. Um, the Chihuahua Pepe is wearing some googly eyes uh, that Mongo has put on him. And Bobby Heenan says, obviously that tarantula has been watching his highlight films. So I guess he's referring to Mongo in that case. Uh, any thoughts on Pepe's new outfit, guys? Uh, I enjoyed it. Um, I did not enjoy Mongo's comment. Uh, if you're not tuning into this, you're his brain dad as most of the people in the Staines family. And I thought that was poor taste. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, he comes at Bobby hard. I thought Pepe's uh, sunglasses were pretty funny, but nothing much more than that. <laughs> so then Ric Flair comes out, and he gives this uh, kind of unintelligible, incoherent <laughs> <laughs> kind of promo where he, he rips off Bischoff's headset to interrupt the commentary team. And then he just, it's nothing like really too special. He just kind of goes off and kind of yells about, we're in Denver and I'm facing Arn Anderson and woo! And like, that's pretty much the the whole like extent of it. But I did like the whole, I'm coming out and I'm taking your headset and I'm interrupting the show. I, I, I kind of like that part of it. But any thoughts on this, guys? Did it make you more excited for Flair Anderson? I, I've come to realize, I feel like Ric Flair is only understandable to me when he's yelling. Um, I've seen him just talking before and it's kind of hard to understand him. So I think Biden's like flair. Uh. Um, I, I watching those, the, the debates recently, Biden will start kind of baseline volume. And then as he, he gets heated up, he starts really increasing the volume at like a, like an exponential rate. And by the end of it, he sounds like Ric Flair doing a promo. I mean, they might be close to the same age. Ric Flair's pretty old, so I don't know. But, uh, yeah, uh, Joe Biden, Ric Flair comparison, that's that's something new. I think I like that. Yeah, he might have been a little coked out in this promo that he did where he took the headset. He was kind of, <laughs> I mean, it was 95, so, I mean, the uh, the, the bad coke times were, were probably past us at this point, but I would – I would not be surprised in this case just because of the way he was acting. What about you, Tex? What would you think of Flair? As far as Flair promos go, this one was on the forgettable side, but I mean, it was still funny and it was still entertaining to see Flair just come out completely wired, you know, snatching the headset and going off on Arn Anderson. So it was entertaining at the very least. So then we jump into what Bischoff calls the first of our double main event. We start off right away with the total package Lex Luger versus the Macho Man Randy Savage. As I said a little earlier, uh, Luger's career in the WCW is on the line, and um, he's also going to forfeit his title shot. I kind of feel like Savage would have agreed to the match just for the title shot opportunity. I don't know why Luger had to double up on the stipulations against him. I just, I guess just to show how confident he is or... Uh, maybe that's the way he's going to finally earn Macho's respect, which seems very important to him. So Mongo scoffs that if Luger loses, 
he's going to have to go back to that other league. And I had an important realization, guys. Uh, Mongo himself was actually on the WWF about like six months prior to this. No and, kidding. Yeah, and we didn't we we didn't really talk about it, but when I was like watching these these episodes, I saw this uh screenshot from like a raw episode that was like, you know, from earlier in 1995 and it had Mongo sitting there with like Vince McMahon in the commentary booth. And I was like, "Oh, well, we got to watch this." And so I I flipped it on and apparently like after WrestleMania 11 with the whole like Lawrence Taylor thing, they were trying to bring in like more like athletes, football players and stuff. And so on this episode, they were talking about how King Kong Bundy was going to face uh, Reggie White. And then they had this whole thing where Kama came out and like confronted Mongo at the commentary booth and like threw water on him. And then Mongo and Kama had this big brawl on the outside and stuff. And so it was just kind of interesting to see like the WWF experimenting with Mongo like far before we see him here on on Nitro and I got to say you can kind of tell Mongo is like happier in the WCW like maybe he was just more comfortable at this point but when I was watching him on Raw I was like he doesn't really seem to be having nearly as much fun as he does when he's on WCW but it could have just been his comfortability with the wrestling business or you know, I don't know, maybe he was just happier down in Atlanta. Yeah, it was interesting to see their their attempts at well, these at these angles cuz I don't think they ever really played out. Like I don't think we got King Kong Bundy versus Reggie White at any point, but I don't I I could be wrong. So anyway, I just thought I'd share that Mongo realization with you guys. And I remember from WrestleMania 11, uh before that Lawrence Taylor match, they brought out a bunch of NFL players and I remember Mongo being one of them. Oh. And, like there was like Ken Norton and like I think Reggie White was with them and it was like a bunch of them. It was a whole group of them. But I, I, did, I wasn't aware of any angle like on Raw or anything after that or prior to. Bischoff lets the audience know during this Luger-Savage match that Hulk Hogan is on the way. Uh, he, he, they're making a big deal about Hogan showing up to Denver and giving us something to stay tuned and look forward to. I do have some, uh, some notes about the choreography of the Savage-Luger match, but I mean, I want to just pick your guys' brains first and see what you thought of it. The way I remember it is they lock up. Um, yep. and that lockup goes for quite a while. They were locked up, then they fall out of the ring, and they lock up again, and then they go to a commercial break or something. Yes. That was, I do not think, the ideal way to start a match. I, I think I know what they were trying to do, like these two titans of wrestling coming together, but that made the the match... I I lost interest pretty quickly. That extended collar and elbow tie-up was probably the longest tie-up I've seen to start a match. And uh, I just thought it was funny how Mongo said there were like two mountain goats locked up. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. But uh, no, overall, like that was kind of a slow start to the match as far as I'm concerned. And then you had, you had a few nice spots with Macho with the axe handle from the top to the outside. And, uh, but then... The whole finish with the ref bump, I thought that whole thing was predictable. I mean, the bump itself from the ref didn't look like it was nearly enough to keep him down that long. And then he, he you know, he magically uh, wakes up when after Giant comes out and choke slams Macho Man. So, and of course, when Macho hits the big elbow, no ref is to be seen ever. So anywhere. So I, don't know. I thought it was kind of a predictable finish. I wound up giving it two stars yeah i mean i think i'm down to give it two i mean it wasn't as good as i expected it to be um i did like the double axe handle to the outside as tech said i liked the spot in the ring where they were doing the backslide and they kept like kind of going back and forth you know savage savage kept trying to drag him down with the backslide and luger kept you know blocking it he even like hooked his foot on the rope so that savage couldn't pull him down and like I'm with you guys that I didn't like the huge lockup spot that took forever in the beginning, but I did like the slow burn of this backslide spot in the middle of the ring, like them grappling for like the position, jockeying for the position, and um, I, I just enjoyed that. It was a real old school kind of thing. But yeah, as Tex said, we get a ref bump, and then the giant comes down uh, once again to uh, meddle in Savage and Luger's affairs, and the giant lays out savage with another monster choke slam the announcers speculate about what this means for luger and his allegiances kind of wondering if maybe luger is in cahoots with the dungeon of doom or what exactly is going on there i thought it was kind of funny that instead of just pinning savage after 
you know, the choke slam, Luger picked Savage up off the ground into the torture rack. Like, I just thought it was like a huge degree of overkill. I mean, I guess maybe Luger didn't see the choke slam and so he didn't know, but it's like Macho is just lying there lifeless and he still like bothers to bend down, pick him up off the ground into the torture rack. Uh, and then, you know, the ref picks up Savage's arm. It falls three times and the match is over. So Lex Luger wins. He's not going to be forfeiting his title shot, and he's not going to be leaving the WCW. I think that's kind of what all of us were predicting was going to happen. I guess using the Giant for interference is a way to, like, protect Savage in this case. Like, he didn't just lose to Luger clean, you know. So I wonder if this is going to be kind of the blow-off to these two guys' little feud they have right now or if we're going to get more of this. I mean, I think the non-clean finish certainly opens the possibility for them to continue the feud. Any other thoughts on Savage Luger? Well, no. I mean, I thought I thought the torture rack, it was like he was picking up dead weight and it looked kind of it looked kind of difficult, especially when he had to get up from being knocked down himself. So, um but yeah, I agree. It was pretty much overkill. I don't know why he had to go through all that when Savage was clearly out of it so after that we got eddie guerrero and dean malenko and so last week they had plugged that we were going to get to see dean malenko and that excited me and i would have been even more excited if i knew that it was with eddie uh so eddie guerrero and dean malenko is kind of a little treat here on on on, on nitro i mean at this point they're both pretty young eddie looks especially young and he's he's kind of guerrero's kind of portraying sort of a squeaky clean baby baby face at this point you know sort of like his character in ecw i noticed he he came out to what eventually became juventud guerrero's music eventually before the match even starts disco inferno comes out and he's just kind of like dancing and you know that was the real treat (laughs) (laughs) that was awesome (laughs) <laughs> it was that was super random like i i enjoyed it i had no i have no idea why they were like hey just go out there and dance and then guerrero is gonna push you out of the way but i i thought that was funny yeah i mean he you know disco had just debuted the previous week so maybe they were just trying to keep him keep him relevant in people's minds you know i think it's a funny thing like him coming out and trying to steal someone else's spotlight and you know before their own match and you know bischoff is strongly objecting to the dancing and the music and uh and, and heenan is loving every second of it basically so good good commentary uh, combo there so after eddie comes out and you know pushes disco out of the way chases him off uh then malenko comes out looking typically stone-faced as he usually does i think from what i could read online when i was researching a bit it seems like Malenko and Guerrero were brought in by the wcw to attract some of the ecw fan base because the Malenko Guerrero encounters on ECW TV were kind of becoming pretty popular and well known. So I think this might have been a way to try to get those, you know, kind of hardcore ECW fans to get more interested in WCW. They're giving Eddie a little bit of a push here on WCW in terms of like, they're just, you know, showing this great highlight reel prior to the match with Malenko where, you know, Eddie defeated Jushin Liger at like main event or Saturday night or some other WCW show. And I gotta say the brainbuster replay where he hit Jushin Liger with that brainbuster it just looked nasty. Cool. Um, yeah, and we actually get a pretty nasty brainbuster in this match um, with Malenko too. But yeah, they just don't do that move the way they used to. <laughs> like same with the pile driver and all these things where you're dropping someone on their head. They just don't really do that anymore. You know, maybe rightfully so. But it's kind of it's kind of fun to see those moves just because they are so brutal, you know. And I have choreography about a lot of stuff that happened during the match. But I mean, what are your guys' thoughts on? This uh, Malenko Guerrero technical masterpiece. This was a fun match to watch. I think what maybe I noticed more so though was there was so much going on during the match, and I feel like a a lot of it had to have been on the the big screen or something at the the event itself that the crowd lost interest because there was a lot of good stuff going on in the ring. But I noticed the energy was not there. I think they were having all the the Hulk Hogan. Here he is in his, you know, he's driving up in his uh, limo, and then they cut away. And I don't know if they were showing that 
in the arena too, but it just seemed like people were not very into this match. Yeah, it could be a few different things. Like maybe they just really didn't know these guys that well. I mean, that's a little surprising, but it could be that where they just don't really know these two wrestlers too closely yet. Um, they could be burned out from the Savage Luger match that opened it up. Yeah, and I did notice that, you know, obviously they were cutting away to Hogan outside, uh, rolling up in his limo, and Jimmy Hart's trying to talk him out of confronting the Giant, but, you know, Hogan is convinced that he must stand up to him for all of his Hulkamaniacs, and he even tells Jimmy Hart, you're either with me or against me, which I thought was, okay, damn, man, all right. Uh, and uh, he's like, you're my best friend, but right now you're either with me or against me. You know, I think the Hogan-Jimmy Hart duo is pretty excellent most of the time. But this really showed this really showed probably to Malenko and Guerrero like exactly where they stood in the pecking order of WCW. Like, we're giving you this great spot, but uh, we're more focused on Hogan and the big stinky giant. What would you think of uh, Guerrero-Malenko, Tex? See, I was pumped for this match. I was really excited because this is the exact kind of match that when I think of WCW in the 90s, like I think of Eddie Guerrero versus Dean Malenko. I think of Ray Jr., Ray Mysterio Jr. versus Juventud Guerrero. Like these are the kind of matches that I, you know, used to get excited for as a kid. You had a really technical opening with all the chain wrestling and then the stalemate and the applause, uh, you know, between pretty much two baby faces. I thought that was. I always think that's a pretty decent spot to have in a babyface match. You just had reversals all over the place, and it was in this one, and it was it was really fun to watch, really fast paced. Then of course you had the match getting interrupted for Hogan arriving in the limo, which I thought took a lot of the match just thunder. But even after that, I mean, you still had some really big spots. You had the crazy Eddie Guerrero cross body to the outside from the top rope. I mean, you see how high up he got? It was ridiculous. And it looked like Malenko almost didn't break his fall because uh, Eddie kind of took, it looked like he took kind of a spill, but it was still good nonetheless. And then that brain buster you mentioned was, it looked pretty brutal, you know. And then we got our, we got an Eddie Frog splash, but uh, Dean Malenko put his knees up to counter and then you had a surprise pin finish. I mean, you had a surprise roll-up finish. Um, so I liked it overall. I gave it two and a half uh, just because I think when they interrupted it for the Hogan promo, took a bit away uh, in my eyes and you know after after business mentioned how the crowd really wasn't into it and it's pretty inconceivable these days to think that you know people wouldn't know who Eddie Guerrero is but hey we're in 95 and yeah he was really young looking yeah and I mean right now in WCW you got like Hogan and the Giant and Savage and Luger and you know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, big boys, as they like to say. There's a lot of big boys. <laughs> there's a lot of big boys playing around. Hulk Hogan just, you know, he does have a tendency to sort of consume, you know, your storylines and your production. I mean, you know, he and this is a this is a prime case of it. And, yeah, I think the, the announced team could have done a better job of, like, really putting over, you know, Guerrero and, and Malenko here and, you know, really explaining to us, you know, how much of a technical master class this is and, you know, how these guys have feuded for a long time or whatever. But I always enjoy when you see two workers who, you know, just clearly have great chemistry together and know each other very well. And, you know, it, it like everything was just so crisp and they really didn't botch anything, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that I think the overall match quality has to be knocked down a few notches just because of the, the lack of crowd enthusiasm and, you know, the kind of multiple storyline narratives we're getting instead of talking about the match. And I think uh, the whole shaking the hands at the end just... I'm with Bobby the Brain. I don't like shaking hands. It kind of made sense for these guys, I guess. You know, Malenko showing good sportsmanship, but also kind of telling Guerrero that he got lucky. But yeah, I think I think there could have been more, like, tension and kind of, like, malice behind that rematch challenge because it almost just seemed too friendly. That's the problem with Dean Malenko. He was, like, you know, an A-plus in the ring, but he gives you like zero on the personality scale so after this hulk hogan comes down to the ring with jimmy hart and jimmy hart is looking pretty nervous hogan still has his neck brace on and he tells a story about being with a young hulkamaniac who was facing a double lung transplant i forget if he mentioned the kid's name jason um, pitt jason pittman that is correct uh yes. And the young fan wants Hogan to come back and take out the giant. And, of course, the Hulkster cannot let his brave young Hulkamaniac down. But then 
in probably the most noteworthy and surprising aspect of Nitro, this old woman comes out of the crowd and begins to beat Hulk Hogan up with her cane. It was even better than that, though. It was, he was, I don't know if he was, like, shaking hands or high-fiving fans, but then the old lady threw a little powder in his eyes. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I forgot that. Yeah, he did, he did. It yeah, jumps right. out and starts beating the crap out of him. And then I think pretty quickly after that, you have the giant and Zodiac start walking out, and you can figure out what's going on. But I thought this was great. This was... Very entertaining. I much prefer this spot to what I think they were uh, billing, which was the American Males versus the Nasty Boys. It turns out that the old lady in the crowd who blinded Hogan and you know started beating him up with her cane, it turns out that that's Kevin Sullivan, the Taskmaster. And as business said, we get Zodiac and the Giant coming down to, to help out with the assault. The Giant once again snaps Hogan's neck. This time he takes off Hogan's neck brace and gives him another lethal, I don't know, I guess a twisting neck snap. I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> and then Sullivan begins to shave off Hulk Hogan's mustache. And I thought that was hilarious. That uh, was awesome. I'm, I'm amazed that Hogan let them do that, kind of, on, on yeah, some level. Thing. I mean, Tex, what did you think of this, uh, this assault on Hulk Hogan? Oh, I thought it was awesome. I, I really did. When Hogan was going around the ring and, you know, slapping hands with all the fans and then uh, the Taskmaster throws the stuff in his eyes. You see a lady like right behind the Taskmaster giving this astounded look as soon as he throws uh, through the, the chalk in his eyes. And when he starts wailing on him with the cane, I thought it was I thought it was hilarious. And But I agree with uh, business. I would have much rather seen this than the American males versus the Nasty Boys. Even still, I thought. When Giant snapped Hogan's neck, I thought the first one looked better. Um, the one from, was it Fall Brawl? I thought that one looked a lot more jarring than this one. Yeah, they, they shouldn't have tried to do it a second time. Yeah, I agree. They should I have agree. had the, the choke slam or something. Did either of you guys notice, so the American males come out, the Nasty Boys come out, all this stuff is going on, Taskmaster is still shaving uh, <laughs> Hogan's mustache, and then he tries to give scissors to Zodiac to give get him to cut the, the mullet. And Zodiac, for whatever reason, won't do it. It wasn't clear to me why he wouldn't cut the cut Hogan's hair. Well, Beefcake and Hogan are like best friends. so I don't Oh, know that shit. Happened. That was OK. Maybe in real life, Ed, Ed Leslie is that guy's name. Uh, maybe in real life, Ed Leslie was like, uh, "I don't want Terry. Uh, I don't want Terry to be pissed off at me about his hair." You know, maybe they were even kind of making a Brutus the Barber beefcake joke there. That must have been what it was. Like they could have been kind of being like, "Oh no, I put that gimmick behind me, or I'm I'm the Zodiac now," or like you know that that could maybe be what it was. But yeah, the American males and the Nasty Boys, instead of getting their spot to have a match tonight, they were instead slotted into this angle. And so the American males and the Nasty Boys try to come out and help. Hulk Hogan, but they basically just all get choke slammed for their troubles. I can't remember which of the American males it was, but like when he tried to come out, he like tried to like kick the giant from uh, outside when he was on the apron, and and he just like bounced off the giant, and, like fell to the outside, and it like it's just like like it was so unhelpful looking. Uh, uh -huh. He he did not contribute to the cause. I think it might have been Buff, but I feel a little bit bad for those guys that they had a match slotted in, and then. You know, Nitro was like, oh, we just don't have time for you guys. But I will agree with you all that this spot in the ring was a lot better than what that match would have been. <laughs> so I felt bad for those guys, but kind of good booking at the same time. You can look at this as another example of Hogan kind of overshadowing younger talent. I mean, they didn't even get their match in, but we got this Hogan promo about him getting his neck snapped again and everything. So Yeah, I mean, I got to say, I think they've done a really good job building the Hogan giant feud. I get more and more excited to see those guys square off, you know, every week. And, you know, this really makes me miss having, like, fewer pay-per-views than we do now. Because, like, now yeah. nowadays, like, they don't really build to anything, really. Like, there was just this Saudi Arabia show on Thursday, uh, Super Showdown, so, like, four days ago. And then a week from today, there's going to be an Elimination Chamber pay-per-view. So it's like... Like, oh, just a week and a half apart, basically, like these two pay-per-views, you know, it's like, 
how can you build anything that people would really care about that way? You know, whereas this, it's like a whole like month and a half, you know, almost like two months of like building up this, this Hogan giant stuff. So I kind of miss the slow burn that they used to have and the long-term booking they used to have. So after Hogan is assaulted, Bobby Heenan is laughing his ass off as his mustache gets shaved and Mongo and Bischoff are just appalled. And so it was good. Good job selling it on commentary too. Our second of our double main event is the enforcer Arn Anderson versus the nature boy Ric Flair. The only thing I really noticed about this match was that it seemed like Flair and Anderson were repeating quite a few of the spots they did from their fall brawl match. Because I just remember watching this one and being like, I remember... You know, Flair taking his, you know, turnbuckle spot over the ropes and getting, like, clotheslined on the apron. And then there was also the spot where Anderson tries to do his, like, a DDT, but Flair holds onto the ropes and, you know, then Anderson falls. And there was just kind of, like, repeated spots from Fall Brawl. And I thought that was a little, uh, I don't know, a little unoriginal. A little, yeah, a little lazy. Not like they're phoning it in, but just kind of a little unoriginal. But, I mean, what did you guys think of this second of our double main event? This was pretty forgettable which was unfortunate there are two things that i remember from it the first was that the wcw executive committee was watching apparently which i think factors into kind of the the end result of the the match and then mongo also has a not nice line uh towards the end because I think it, it it's dealing with the fact that Ric Flair is pretty isolated now amongst the wrestlers. Um, but if you want to walk through the the match real quick, I'll bring up this because I think it kind of rounds out the show. Like y'all said, I thought it was pretty uh, pretty forgettable. But it's that doesn't make it a bad match in a way. I mean, you know, we still got some nice things from Ric Flair and Arn Anderson. I thought Arn looked pretty good. Uh, overall, we did get a spine buster from Arn out of nowhere, and where he couldn't capitalize, he you know wound up getting a two count. I thought the DDT spot on the ropes where Arn yells out DDT and then Flair counters it, I thought that was pretty funny. But overall, I mean, you know, the match was uh, match was a little little forgettable for me. Mongo and Bischoff did a little shit talking on Raw. They were they were kind of you know, throwing shade at the WWF again. Um, I noticed that, like, Heenan, Heenan kind of deflected it. And, you know, I actually read in Heenan's book that he never once joined in on the WWF bashing live on air. And he actually wrote in his book that by not joining in, he actually kind of pissed Bischoff off, oh. um, which I think was, was kind of interesting. But, like, yeah, you can kind of – you can notice whenever they talk shit on the WWF, Heenan kind of just tries to go back to something that's happening in the match or – Keenan just suddenly goes quiet. I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, Bischoff announces to everyone that the O.J. Simpson verdict will be read live tomorrow on CNN. Bischoff, Heenan, and Mongo mock the fact that the verdict was returned so quickly. We get a figure four in the center of the ring. Uh, Flair slaps it on Anderson. But then Brian Pillman runs out to save his new buddy, Arn Anderson, and he hits Flair with a splash from the top rope, but apparently it wasn't in the nick of time because Arn Anderson had already submitted. I did Uh, not realize he had submitted. Yeah, I read that. See, like, when I watched the match, I didn't even quite follow that. I just thought it was, like, a DQ or something. But when I was reading different, like, recap reports of the the episode, people were listing that as the official finish. So, I'm, you know, I'm not, like, totally sure. The ref went and waved for the bell, like, right before Pillman landed that splash. Basically, Pillman and Anderson kind of give Flair a beat down. You know, they keep playing, they keep playing up the whole friendless Flair thing, you know, where he doesn't have anybody to turn to. He's burned all of his bridges. After the beat down, Pillman lets out a raspy, woo! On the way back to the locker room, pretty sure Pillman holds up the Four Horsemen sign again to mock them and everything. Business, do you want to bring in uh, the the Mongo line? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They they say Atlantis was an island, and we all know what happened to that place. Oh, my God. You're right. You're right. (laughs) And then, well, the best part is that Eric Bischoff goes, it sank. (laughs) (laughs) But no, I got a big kick out of that. But uh, I forgot that. Yeah, that's right. That's good. I really <laughs> do love all this. Like WCW executive committee is watching stuff. Like I get a kick out of the whole like management structure 
paying attention and then making on the fly decisions like because of the end of this match uh, Nick Bockwinkle is going to grant a cage match on the next Nitro and I'm actually really looking forward to that I think that'll be awesome yeah um, as business said WCW Commissioner Nick Bockwinkle has sanctioned a Flair versus Anderson cage match for next week. Bischoff also plugs the rest of the card for next week. Uh, we're going to get Sting versus Shark. We're going to have the return of Sabu versus Mr. JL. So I'm excited to see Sabu again. Uh, we're also going to get Road Warrior Hawk versus Big Bubba Rogers. Uh, so that should be a, a hoss fest in there with those two huge guys <laughs> duking it out. I'm looking forward to the, the cage match. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the cage match, and I'm looking forward to seeing Sabu again. So those are probably the Sting versus Shark. Maybe it'll pleasantly surprise me. I mean, I guess I enjoyed this Nitro overall. Um, I think kind of like the one from last time, the promos were sort of the best part. I mean, I did enjoy the Eddie Guerrero-Dean Malenko match, but its production wasn't as good as it could have been, so that that sort of (laughs) dragged it down. But yeah, the whole thing with Hogan getting attacked by the Taskmaster grandma uh, and, you know, getting his mustache shaved and all that was just awesome. So, I mean, what are your guys' thoughts on on Nitro? I'm pretty much the same. The the double main event not a, didn't do a whole lot for me. I am looking forward to the, the cage match next week, but the, the, uh, the Taskmaster spot was incredible. I thought it was much better than last week's show uh, considerably. Um, but I thought we could have had like Macho versus Luger to close the show rather than Arn versus Flair. Um, you know, I just thought I thought Macho and Luger would have given it a little bit more punch to end uh, to close the show out. But yeah, the the Taskmaster and Hogan spot uh, was excellent. So this was much better than last week. It was much better card. Overall, I uh, I noticed that the two shows this week got the exact same TV rating. So for these October second ninety five shows, they were both at two point five. And I think this is the first time that we've had an exact tie in the Nielsen ratings for the shows. I don't know if I would say that they were that close because we're gonna get into Raw here in a second, and um, I got I think I think Nitro won, but I don't I don't want to jump the gun too much. So the the October second episode of raw was actually a taped show from september 25th when they did their show in grand rapids so they had that one live episode in grand rapids last time but i guess this one was also taped at that same date so i was a little disappointed that the wwf was giving us taped programming again there's actually a few times during the evening where they'll be like, stay tuned, you know, up next on Raw, and then they'll, like, show something from the Bret Hart, John pierre Lafitte match we're, we're going to get. <laughs> and it's just kind of like, damn, man, you're not even really trying to hide the fact that it's taped. Like, I think they did, though, because they do the whole O.J. Simpson hotline, and they say the verdict comes out tomorrow. And I think the verdict came out on a Tuesday. So they were kind of, like, trying to play along that, oh, yeah, we're, we're still live. I, or some weird hybrid of it. But yeah, it was a little disconcerting. I think they've done a good job with the commentating when it's a tape show to make it seem like it's live. Like they'll bring up stuff that's a little bit more relevant to the exact date. But if you're showing highlights from the matches that are to come <laughs> early in the evening... You're showing these highlights from later matches. I mean, it's just so obvious that they have the tape already, you know. I think since you brought up the OJ thing, I think we might as well talk about that now. So, yeah, on WCW, they made a passing mention of it, you know. But on Raw, the WWF actually decided to, you know, do this, like, poll. It was an audience poll where, you know, they could call in. And if if you called in, you paid 50 cents And then you could vote on, you know, whether it was going to be guilty or not guilty. And the WWF said that all the proceeds were going to go to the National Exchange Club Foundation for the Prevention of Child Abuse. I'm going to step in real quick. Okay. 50 cents per minute. It just says each call costs 50 cents. Okay, 50 cents. I think it was only 20 cents per vote went to charity. It sounds like they're pocketing 30 cents. I read online that apparently the WWF got into hot water with this because the National Exchange Club had no idea that the WWF was doing this poll, and they did not want to be affiliated with it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't blame them. 
Wow. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure most people in the WWF, like I've heard Bruce Pritchard talk about this OJ thing in the past, and I think most of them look back now on it and like that was a super regrettable thing to do. Uh, but it, yeah, it's a little tasteless. I thought it was kind of like pointless a little bit in the end since like it was like 51% said guilty and 49 said not guilty or maybe the other way around but it was a 51 49 split 50 50 split between wwf fans right because the world needed to know what the wwf fans thought. <laughs> that was a thread throughout the episode of raw was the whole you know oj simpson verdict last week on raw we had undertaker and the british bulldog as the main event which ended up in a big schmaz tonight we are getting Razor Ramon versus the One Two Three Kid. We're also going to get a rematch of Bret Hart and Jean Pierre Lafitte from their In Your House battle that they had recently. Yeah, and a few other matches too. But the it starts off with Vince McMahon and Jerry the King Lawler. They show some footage of the Smoking Guns winning the tag titles on last week's Raw over Yokozuna and Owen Hart. And then the opening contest we get for this evening's Raw is Razor Ramon and 123 Kid and there has been a lot of heat in this feud. Kid has been kind of constantly getting in Ramon's way and getting involved in his matches and you know they've had a couple verbal altercations in the ring. Most recently 123 Kid got involved during the Razor Dean Douglas match at In Your House. Razor actually like pushed him and knocked him to the outside and it seemed like you know they were really at each other's throats and starting to things were starting to get pretty tense and this match played out very interestingly uh what did you guys think of this most recent kid razor match like did a lot i love the fact that it just um turned into razor beating the hell out of one two three kid well deserved more or less just punishing him <laughs> He never did the razor's edge though, right? No, no. no even though, even though one two three kid was basically begging him to do it at the end, basically. Exactly. It's so weird. And then with this match, I also noticed that in this case, I think it was Vince spelled out R E S P E C T because one two three kid was looking for respect. And I think on Nitro, in the Luger uh, Macho Man match. One of the commentators there also spelled out R E S P E C T. So I thought it was a little weird that you had two matches same night. You know, not a not an odd situation where one wrestler is looking for respect from the other, but both with the Aretha uh, Franklin references. Normally, with Razor versus Kid matches, you know, they're the the chemistry shines through, and this was no this was no exception. The only thing that threw me off was when they kept like restarting the match. I wasn't sure at first. Like the first time when uh, Razor finished him with a clothesline, I wasn't quite sure if it was like a two out of three falls or what. Um, I had no idea why they were starting the match back up. Uh, but overall, I mean, you had some nice spots in there. The Razor uh, abdominal stretch where he pulls the leg, I always liked when he did that. And he always seemed to do it to smaller guys, uh, particularly uh, the one, two, three kid. But yeah, there are a lot of moves that look pretty stiff, like when he caught Kid off the top of the rope for that uh that power bomb for the three count. And I was kind of hoping he would just give him a razor's edge at the end. Like the crowd was chanting razor's edge. Kid was basically begging him to do it. I just kind of wanted to see it after all that. <laughs> I just love the beatdown. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I gotta say this kind of angle they were doing with the match. It you know it's not something you see all the time where. You know, the the loser keeps egging on the winner of the match to, to restart and keep going. and Because, you know, Razor gets a pinfall out of nowhere with a clothesline. But then the kid immediately demands a rematch right then and there. Uh, Ramon catches him with a powerbomb, as Tech said. So that's another pinfall. Then <laughs> Razor's gonna do the Razor's Edge, but then he decides just to give him a small package. And so that's, like, the third pinfall. And then after the bell, like, Ramon slaps the back of the kid's head and, and all that stuff to kind of add insult to injury. But then they kind of, like, laugh things off. The kid the kid tries to, like, hit a surprise small package at the end uh, to show that he hasn't even given up quite yet. You know, they sort of make peace with each other. They shake hands. Uh, the kid even offers to sacrifice himself for the razor's edge. An ultimate sign of, I guess 
submitting. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Anyway, um, McMahon talks a lot about the one, two, three kid having spunk. Um, and I'm pretty sure Lawler says something about how he got the spunk beaten out of him. I thought it was funny that, you know, so Ramon, Ramon puts over the kid a few times in the past, lets him beat him a few times. And I kind of wonder if Scott Hall is kind of like, well, you know, you've beaten me twice. How about I just beat you three times in one match? And we'll, we'll, we'll call it a deal. Razor got his receipt and then sub. So if you look back in the annals of time now, Razor will officially have more pinfalls over the one, two, three kid. So McMahon and Lawler recap the In Your House 4 card that we're going to get later in the month. We also get some footage of Mabel and the British Bulldog beating down The Undertaker at the end of last week's Raw before Shawn Michaels and Diesel made the save. There's a very quick promo of Hunter Hearst Helmsley in the back telling the audience that there is a, quote, fat chance that Barry Harwitz will beat him tonight. Then we get Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus Barry Harwitz. Last week, we had talked a lot about Skip and the Body Donnas. And we were wondering about when they had debuted. And this footage that they showed of Barry Harwitz beating Skip, uh, that indicates that they were around a lot longer than I think we had thought. And I even brought up the Barry Harwitz-Skip feud as being like the most famous thing Skip ever did. But I guess like th that's already passed, you know. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of clarify that too. So that put footage though, that they showed where uh, Barry Horowitz beat Skip, and that was a tag team match, right? Well, I think he has beaten him in a tag match. But it all started with just Horowitz was a jobber. And he was having a match with Skip. And Skip had knocked him down. And Skip was doing his push-up spot where he's, like, showing off by doing his push-ups. And Horowitz, like, caught him in a roll-up, like, while he was doing, like, the push-ups and beat him. And then they even had, like, a rematch of that on a pay-per-view. And Horowitz beat him again. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, Horowitz had multiple pinfalls over Skip. They even brought up the fact that Barry Horowitz and Hakushi were a tag team at this point. Which, that is <laughs> what I was getting at. Is this post-Hakushi? Well, no, apparently it's like, they are, they, they brought Hakushi in and he mostly just feuded with Bret Hart at first. Yeah, I guess right now, Horowitz and Hakushi have a tag team, and... You know, I, I, I thought to myself, like, oh, yeah, I do kind of remember that from when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But they, they were mentioning that Horowitz was, like, teaching Hakushi the American, American way. The American way. And that really made me want to try to find, like, try to dig and find some promo of the two of them goofing around and stuff. Like, I, I that sounds like it'd be pretty funny to me. What did you guys think of uh, Hunter Hearst Helmsley and Barry Horowitz? The Triple H... And I know he's not really Triple H at this point, or I don't. Did they call him Triple H yet? No, no. I yeah. The curtsy is so weird, <laughs> as like a a thing for a wrestler to like uh, do as a spot in the ring. He's so lucky he was able to to take that and basically just take the Triple H and keep that from his uh, his original gimmick. I did enjoy. The king saying he couldn't be in a jury because he has no peers. <laughs> oh, and then there was also all this discussion about the Pope uh, was invited to Madison Square Garden for a WWF benefit uh, that Friday. Did I have you pick up on that? Yeah, McMahon was basically hoping, it sounded like, that Pope John Paul II would come to a charity benefit at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, yeah. I, I did catch I, that. Maybe Vince was doing something around this time where he was a little... Uh, his thinking wasn't totally clear because he... The whole OJ thing and then saying, ah, the Pope got to come to Madison Square, Square Garden seems a little off. Both commentators were seemingly more interested in other angles than in this match itself because Lawler... Yeah, Lawler spent a lot of time making O.J. Simpson jokes. Uh, he wished Johnny Cochran a happy birthday. Um, and, yeah, they, were, they weren't really paying too much attention to the in-ring work. Uh, what did you think of uh, Helmsley Horowitz, Tex? Well, anytime Horowitz is involved, I'm down to watch. I love Barry Horowitz. Uh, and, I mean, he came out. You had Barry Chance. The crowd was chanting Barry. I couldn't believe it. Had a nice vertical suplex from Triple H, nice hanging vertical suplex. The curtsy taunts, man. They throw me off every time. Uh, like, I don't know if Hunter was just supposed to come off like a Greenwich, Connecticut 
rich guy, but he winds he winds up like kind of more coming off as like the villain from the movie Patriot uh, with Mel Gibson. <laughs> that's what he that's what he reminds me of. Like he reminds me of that guy from like the Revolutionary War. What I really liked from Barry Horowitz was that Luthez press, and he got a near fall on it. That was one of the highlights of the match for me. I mean, obviously, uh, Hunter was going to finish it off with a pedigree, but I thought it was entertaining overall. I gave it one and a half stars. I enjoyed the match itself more than the commentators gave it credit for, it seems. As Tech said, Helmsley wins with the pedigree. So when, when Helmsley was in WCW, he went by, I think, Jean-Paul Le- Levesque. Um, and his real name is Paul Levesque. It was like a very similar kind of gimmick in WCW, except he was French, you know, like Jean-Paul Levesque. Uh, and he, but he did like the same kind of stuff where he sort of stuck his nose in the air, walked around kind of prancy, you know, did the curtsy, everything like that. Yeah, the curtsy is kind of weird, but I, I sort of enjoy it just because it's kind of a unique taunt, you know, and it, it's very, like, hateable, too. I think, like, if you, see, if you see someone do that, it's it draws a lot of heat. It's like, oh, this arrogant, oh, yeah. this arrogant prick. Or, or he's like a pansy or an arrogant prick who's a pansy. It, it gets a lot of heat. My favorite part of Monday Night Raw uh was the debut well maybe not the debut but the debut on raw for a tag team called pg-13 um and they were going up against a couple of jobbers named sonny rogers and al brown uh, uh. so so pg-13 the announcer says that when they're coming down to the ring he says he's like from the hood <laughs> 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 and i i i actually <laughs> I actually didn't catch that the first time I watched the match, but I went back and rewatched this match. This was the only part of Raw I rewatched just because I was I wanted to get every little nugget of this that I could. And I noticed the second viewing that you the announcer announces them from hailing from the hood, basically. So I, <laughs> I, I, I thought that was pretty awesome. These guys' names are JC Ice and Wolfie D. Uh, and they are called PG-13... We will eventually see them as those two skinny white boys that followed around the Nation of Domination and rapped their theme song. Tex is going to cover PG-13 for Jobber Watch this week, and so I want to hear what he found out. Well, yeah, so normally we just, you know, we talk about Jobbers on Jobber Watch, but you know, know PG-13, they're not technically Jobbers. They kind of more come off as Jobbers. You know, they wind up being those guys that, you know, rap for the nation of domination as they came out <laughs> and they would they would always kind of get beat up anytime things would get mixed up with them these guys pg-13 they were actually 15 time uswa tag champions so their names are actually kelly wolf and jamie dundee they went through uh, the wwf wcw and ecw and always stayed a team so that's one thing notable about them it's kind of rare uh, they passed through three different companies, stayed a team throughout. After their stint in the WWF uh, with the Nation Domination, they wind up in the ECW, and they would actually win the tag titles from Spike Dudley and Mikey Whipwreck. And then they would lose the tag titles to the Dudley Boys later that year. I did read online about their stint in the USWA. I didn't know that they were 15-time champs in the USWA. That's That's pretty incredible, especially back then where racking up the the titles was not as common as it is now. Yeah, apparently this was a talent exchange uh, with the USWA, where the WWF and them were kind of working together to have PG-13 and the Smoking Guns have kind of a small feud. And during this match on Raw, PG-13 is even shown in like a split-screen kind of format where they're cutting a promo on the guns. It wasn't anything too special, but you know they're definitely trying to build this feud between the tag teams. I guess it kind of shows how thin the uh, the WWF tag team division is right now, that you got to bring in somebody from the outside to face your champions. Um, I mean, we did have Yoko and Owen as the, the champions before the guns, and they're not even really like a traditional tag team. That makes a whole lot of sense. Right now, it's just kind of slim pickings. Uh, you know, not that many teams to use. And, you know, PG-13 is obviously a pretty, like, laughable gimmick in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, they, they dress really foolishly. They kind of reminded me a lot of, um, you know, Scotty Too Hottie and Grandmaster Sexay in a way. Yeah. Where, you know, they're kind of doing these, like, goofy dances in the ring throughout. And, you know, I'm pretty sure it's J.C. Ice was kind of doing a little freestyle rap 
before the match started and their in-ring work was was pretty good they had a lot of kind of smooth double team moves you know they they have this kind of finisher where jc ice bounces off the ropes and then wolfie d kind of he almost like gut wrench suplexes jc ice onto their opponent they're both a little undersized. I think JC Ice is especially small. Like he's only like five eight or something. Um, and so yeah, they they're not going to win a lot of intimidation points. Uh, but I think I think they were pretty fun. You know, I think the gimmick is cheesy, but kind of in a good way. And I think a match between them and the Smoking Guns would actually be pretty good. So you know, hopefully we get to see that at some point. Business. What do you think about uh, PG thirteen? It's just a silly gimmick. The whole punks from the hood and they just kept saying ah yeah they're from the hood or oh, don't you know mcmahon they're from the hood and it, it, yeah like like which hood you know exactly I mean... like <laughs> what, what hood are we talking about um and then it's funny the the jobbers that they went up against i didn't realize the guy's name was al brown <laughs> i kept hearing outbound and so that's what I wrote as like, I was like, that's a weird name outbound. <laughs> um, but thank you for clearing that up for me. But yeah, this was, this was a, a silly match. The other funny thing is that Vince McMahon seemed to just not know anything about PG 13. Like he kept, he kept talking to Lawler and being like, now wait, is that JC Heiss or is that Wolfie D? Is that, who is that? Yeah. You know, he, he was, was getting like, them mixed up. He, he would was. call the wrong guy in the, in the ring. Yeah. Several times. Yeah. 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 Like, Pretty much, pretty much every single time, either one of them was in the ring. It was just Wolfie D, uh, and yeah, and he had no idea what was going on with PG thirteen. So I think we'll eventually get to see them in the Smoking Guns at some point. Um, they beat Sonny Rogers and Al Brown and had their fun Raw debut. So then we get Doc Hendricks hyping a Bret Hart signature T-shirt and a WWF Classic videotape leading up to the Bret Hart Jean Pierre Lafitte rematch that we're going to get as the main event here on raw so they had just recently battled each other at the in your house three pay-per-view they really beat the hell out of each other at at that pay-per-view uh there were a lot of like nasty spots uh that looked really painful and you know so i don't think they went quite as hard here on raw as they did at that pay-per-view um but i certainly enjoyed this match um there were some fun kind of spots where you know, Bret Hart slammed Jean-Pierre onto the steel steps. I just kind of remember being like, my my main impression was this was good, but the In Your House match was better. They introduced sort of a new angle at the end of the match for, for Bret in the future, but what did you guys think of this Bret Hart Lafitte con- contest here? I noticed that Jerry the King really hammed it up on his hatred of Bret during the match. And then the other thing I noticed was that it seemed like John, Jean-Pierre Lafitte dominated Brett for like 90% of the match. And I think they should have let him win. Well, yeah, because, you know, he takes two clean uh, defeats from Bret Hart here. It was like, well, are they really taking uh, Jean-Pierre Lafitte seriously? Um it's really kind of hard to uh, kind of hard to say. Uh, he had two really good matches with Brett too. I mean, we didn't wind up reviewing uh, that in your house match, but like Frank said, uh, this match was pretty much like that, except you know they didn't go quite as hard. I mean, it was on Monday Night Raw. Uh, that being said, I thought it was still excellent. Uh, you know, one thing I find interesting about Jean Pierre Lafitte are those double punches. Uh, I don't, I don't get them. I know that, uh, <laughs> I know that King said he was hitting him twice, you know, one for him and one for King. So, you know, one for John Pierre Lafitte, one for King, uh, the spot where Bret Hart slams, uh, Pierre Lafitte on top of the, uh, steel steps. It looked like he slammed him right on the corner. And so I thought that looked painful as hell. Um, but anytime the King goes full heel mode on Bret Hart, I thought, I think it's entertaining. I mean, he really just like brings up the past and I think it's awesome. Let's brings see. up his dad. Yeah. Like anytime he makes fun of his parents, he makes fun of us uh, doing Helen Hart. I think it's always hilarious. <laughs> it's, it's so funny, but yeah, you had some, uh, you had some nice uh, high spots in there, like with, uh, Jean-Pierre Lafitte 
or he missed the guillotine leg drop from the top rope. You know, he whipped he whipped Bret Hart into the steel steps. I thought that had a really high impact. You could hear the you could hear the impact there. And then you had a Bret baby face comeback. And in a lot of Bret matches, he gets his he gets his ass kicked for like you know the majority of the match, and then winds up coming back. You know, there's you know his gut punch, a Russian leg sweep spot, pendulum backbreaker to that second rope elbow. And then that usually leads to the sharpshooter. So, but yeah, we had a nice uh, top rope superplex in there too that led right into the sharpshooter. And anytime we get a Bret Hart top rope superplex, I'm on board for it. So yeah, I, I wound up giving it three and a half stars. It's one of the highest rated matches that we've done so far uh, for me. Another example of the excellence of execution doing what he does best. Bret is one of the best in ring storytellers there has ever been. Um, and he can get a good match out of just about anybody. You know, in his own right, I think Jean-Pierre Lafitte is a pretty pretty great worker, too. Uh, it's too bad that he didn't get, you know, a bigger push. You know, he kind of got that pirate gimmick, and then later he was in the Quebecers, or maybe earlier he was in the Quebecers. I'm losing track. Uh, but, he, you know, he didn't have very good gimmicks in the WWF. So, yeah, Brett wins the match, and then afterwards, Bret Hart and Jerry Lawler kind of trade some blows near the announce table. And then Isaac Yankum, who is the king's dentist, uh, runs out and attacks Brett. He gives him his DDS finisher on the floor, which is just like a DDT. A bunch of WWF refs pour out to try to break it up. I like how the crowd was chanting for Diesel to like do something. And then <laughs> Big Daddy Cool just never came out. You know, uh, apparently he doesn't care that much about Bret Hart or he's got better things to do. The whole Jerry Lawler, Bret Hart thing is pretty great. You know, the, at this point, they already have quite a bit of history between them. You know, they did a kiss my foot match uh, mm -hmm. where Lawler had to actually kiss Bret's foot. Um, I remember they did like an in your house on like Mother's Day or something uh, back in the day, a few years prior to this. And maybe that was like the first in your house or the second one. Some event was on Mother's Day and... So Helen Hart was there, and then Jerry Lawler had his quote-unquote mother with him. But it was just this like hot supermodel was his mother. It was it was it was really it was really weird because you know Vince McMahon kept being like, oh, so this is your mother, huh? And Jerry Lawler's like, yeah, what? What's the problem, McMahon? Like it's just like, and she was just you know she just looked like she was maybe like thirty-five. I always thought that was funny. And then Lawler Lawler was always claiming that Brett was talking shit about his mother, you know, even though it's it's definitely the other way around. Yeah. Um, but this is continuing off of the Lawler Brett Hart, you know, beef. Um, they're almost unearthing it when maybe it should just be put to rest. Uh, because, I mean, these guys have already had multiple matches. Lawler had to kiss Brett's foot. Like, that's kind of a blow-off to a feud right there. I don't think you really need to keep this one going. But I guess it's a way to get Isaac Yankum involved. And so when we return from the commercial break after the attack on Brett, McMahon announces that Brett and Yankum are going to face off in a cage match in a few weeks on Raw. Uh, per the orders of interim WWF president Gorilla Monsoon. So they're not countering Nitro's cage match with a cage match on the same night, but they are promising us a cage match between Yankum and Brett. So that's kind of nice. I'm sure it'll be okay, you know. Uh, the future Kane and, and Bret Hart in a, in a cage shouldn't be too bad. They're really plugging next week's Raw's main event quite a bit because we're going to get a six-man tag match next week so it's going to be owen hart yokozuna and the bulldog versus diesel Shawn michaels and the undertaker and so we get these kind of back-to-back -back promos from the two the two teams that are going to be feuding next week um they got owen hart yoko and bulldog in the back with cornet and fuji and they basically just say that they're going to wipe out the their opponents next week did you guys notice what undertaker said about them in his promo like the rotting carcasses and how the vultures will be circling and then when night falls so will you i thought that was awesome yeah because everything up until undertaker spoke was very very generic taker finally said something that was really unique and different and it was a little corny but but i really liked it it uh it, it made me laugh what do you guys think about these promos and what do you think about this six-man tag that we're going to get next week I, I'm I'm looking forward to the six man tag. The the Undertaker's my only issue with it was he started it with these guys think this is going to be a party, 
And then he ended it with, but we will be the vultures that like feast on your carcasses. Like it did not follow. It was a little <laughs> weird. I thought, I thought he stole the show between both promos, honestly. I mean, he, like, uh, like Frank said, he used the one that he was the only one that said anything interesting uh, in either of those promos to me. So, you know, next week on Raw, we'll get that six man tag match. They didn't really announce very much else about the card for next week's Raw. Um, I'm thinking that it's going to be live, but we'll have to see. You know, maybe it's going to be another taped show. That's going to be going up against, you know, the Nitro show um, where. We have a whole bunch of things on the card that they announced for Nitro already, so that card is a lot less vague at this point. You know, we're going to get Anderson and Flair in a steel cage. Also excited about the return of Sabu. I guess the last thing to mention is that the OJ poll, the OJ Simpson poll that they did on Raw throughout the night ended with 49% of fans voting guilty and 51 voting not guilty. I think Nitro was... Like, at least for me personally, I think Nitro was better this week. You know, I enjoyed seeing PG-13 on Raw, like, just kind of out of a a novelty of it, you know, because I remembered them with the Nation of Domination, but I really didn't know much about them before that. Um, And so this was, that was kind of just a nice little, you know, nugget there on Raw for me. But I didn't get a ton out of the Bret Hart, John Pierre Lafitte match just because, you know, I had just seen it at a pay-per-view and... I feel like it was really hard to follow up what their pay-per-view match was, you know, and I'm not like, you know, having Brett feud with Isaac Yankum, that's not really turning me on too much. You know, I'm not a huge fan of six man tag matches, uh, just personally. So I just feel like raw didn't really get me too excited. Whereas watching nitro, I felt more and more excited about the giant and Hogan. And, you know, I just was a lot more into nitro overall. Um, I don't know if you guys felt similarly or it's funny because when I was originally thinking about this, I was going to give the win to uh raw for the night, but having gone through both, I am also going to give it to, to nitro the, the taskmaster spot. I loved, and I am definitely more excited for next week. Um, next week's Monday night nitro, as opposed to the, the Monday night raw, the only other thing I'll say is, did either of you catch the King uh, giving an emphatic go juice after the the 51% no vote was? Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, that was a little. I was like, whoa. It's it's the whole thing is tripping me out, man. Like you had the 50% the 51% no vote, and then when they announced the verdict in real life, it was like 99% of people thought it was the wrong verdict you know so mm-hmm. i just thought that was interesting either way um i thought nitro was the better show overall but i thought in a way i thought that the best two matches were on raw but i think nitro's show overall their overall product was better i agree with you like i think razor and the kid and brett and lafitte were the best matches i think that only could be rivaled by guerrero and malenko on nitro yeah. Um, but I think the problem with the two matches on Raw is that we had just already seen both of them, you know, yep. like, and recently. Um, and so, you know, they tried to do something a little bit different with Razor and the Kid where you had that kind of just multiple pinfalls. The Kid never gives up once, rematch after rematch after rematch. So that was kind of nice. Um, but I'm trying to, I'm sort of trying to judge the shows mostly on my gut of just like how excited they made me for what's to come. So far, Raw has rarely beaten Nitro in that regard for me. Um, I'm almost always more excited about what's going on in WCW at this point. And it might just be because I didn't really watch all of this WCW stuff very closely, you know, when I was growing up compared, mm-hmm. compared to following along with Raw. So maybe on one level, the kind of novelty and newness of it is is kind of winning me over but i'd like to think i'm objective enough to be able to just kind of say that one was a better production a better show um i'm i have to always give nitro some bonus points for actually being live uh that really matters to me for some reason <laughs> um like i think you can have a good taped show but just if it's not live i just feel like it's weak you know it's it just shows it just shows weakness 
Uh, like you don't you don't trust your workers and your production crew to put on a good live show and you're cutting corners by doing these multiple tape shows and you know so I mean they did tie in the ratings this week so it, it didn't hurt them that badly but to reiterate next week on Raw we're gonna get Owen Yoko and Bulldog versus Diesel Shawn Michaels and Undertaker in a six man tag and then on Nitro we're gonna get Arn Anderson and Ric Flair in a steel cage. Any uh, final comments on these two episodes from October second, nineteen ninety five? No, no. I think uh, I think we covered it. I'm looking forward to Nitro. Raw, not so much. <laughs> yeah, same here. I'm looking forward to next week, but uh, particularly Nitro in that cage match. Yeah, it would have been nice if Raw announced a little bit more of their card next week because it's just like all we know is this six man tag and like that kind of spells out to me that we're probably just going to get jobber matches leading up to that. Like, uh, if they didn't announce or plug anything, I I just can't foresee there being a great mid card on that show. <laughs> uh, um, but anyway, so yeah, we will we will cover the October ninth episodes of the shows next time, and you know we'll be leading up to In Your House four in Winnipeg that we're gonna review together. So that'll be fun, and then we'll eventually get Halloween Havoc at the end of October 95 and you know we'll be reviewing that as well for big business and big techs this is Frank Incensed and thanks for listening